Hello soldiers, this is Chuck Walla here with a video for you about a masterclass of a first person shooter which specializes in immersion and teamwork. It is called Hell Let Loose. Together, we will examine this game through the lens of game design and gameplay, which in some cases juxtaposes mainstream first person shooters in modern gaming. I will focus more on overarching concepts rather than specific mechanics. There are other YouTube tutorials out there. One I like is called Soul Sniper. I'll link his channel in the description below. And if you're new to this game, he's a good one to check out. But if you're new to this channel, if you could hit the thumbs up and consider subscribing, that'd be great. So in the meantime, let's just sit back, relax, and dig into this game. So I'll start with background and setting. The name Hell Let Loose is perfectly fitting, as being alive in the late 1930s into the mid 1940s probably felt like hell was let loose in the world. The bloodiest war of human history was being waged across multiple continents and extending into virtually all parts of the globe. It is estimated that around 60 million people lost their lives. Without getting into a history lesson, this game is set in the war-torn Europe of Belgium, France, and Germany, with some of the new maps also being set in Egypt and Russia. The big takeaway here is that this game is set in real places and features real battles in a real war. Actual people died and the world was forever changed. Given its impact on society, we have seen this war inspire countless movies, TV shows, and video games. In regards to gaming, I'd argue no other video game has captured the moment-to-moment -moment immersive battle experience set in this war as well as this game does. It is unapologetic in its approach to authenticity in representing the history, the people who fought, the areas they fought, and the weapons that they used. In the gaming industry, game settings are often soiled by financial decisions to introduce popular game mechanics and goofy cosmetics to drive mainstream popularity despite the setting. Call of Duty and Battlefield being the biggest offenders here. This is not Call of Duty. There's no Snoop Dogg skins in the game, there's no weird World War II red dot sites, nor is it battlefield with the Japanese soldiers running around and killing people with katanas in Belgium. Hell Let Loose has crafted an experience that doesn't compromise its setting. So if you're not familiar with the game, it's a large scale team based first person shooter with a strong emphasis on teamwork through communication and fulfilling squad roles. There are two modes, warfare and offensive, and without going into much detail, basically either mode, the game is about map control. It is up to the teams to figure out how to best dominate an area to gain control of the point in order to push back the enemy. Next, I wanna talk about map design and its influence on gameplay. One of the first things I appreciated about the maps in Hell Let Loose was that they were inspired by real places. This game captures infantry-based battles waged mostly on the eastern and western fronts and obviously aren't your typical three-lane video game first-person shooter maps. To simply put it, the vast open map design combined with the player's vulnerability facilitates communication and realistic strategies, which underpin the core gameplay experience. This semi-realistic map design only provides soldiers with sparse cover, and for many newcomers, the size of the map and the lack of cover is simply shocking. You see, this design is intentional and encourages teamwork and real-world tactics. Players use hedgerows to conceal their silhouette on the horizon and duck into ditches and bomb craters to stay low. Players will use tanks as cover to cross open fields. I could go into many more examples, but I think you get the idea. This happens because when a player continuously dies using conventional FPS knowledge, they will adapt to survive by using cover, ducking behind walls, and listening for the sound of footsteps and enemy gunfire. They immerse themselves in this virtual battlefield to make moment-to-moment -moment decisions that are critical to survival, and the environment becomes much more than decoration. This dangerous world requires a slow and methodical approach to navigate a battle, knowing that death is but one bullet away. Frenetic shooters such as the Finals or Apex Legends have a place, but this game is the opposite and prides itself in punishing players who don't comply. With spawns sometimes taking up to 30 seconds, death can be a very negative experience. As the strict teacher who will take you away from the action and deprive you of the experience you're looking for if you don't slow down. In this game, the small details such as a small ditch or a hay bale may be the only thing keeping the player alive. And the huge scale and realistic settings without a ton of distinct landmarks often makes me use my maps for navigation. The more time I spend playing this game, the more time I spend studying my map, as I've started to rely on the map for plotting strategies and considering where the enemy garrisons are likely located. I've begun to look at the lines on the map, which represent roads and alleyways, and consider their specific or relative angle to the capture point. I find myself thinking about how much cover that specific area might have, or how many enemies are likely there. In the same way soldiers in World War II didn't have GPS, neither do you in this game. And using the compass and the map to navigate around is an actual skill. Yes, there are other ways to see where the objective is by activating your heads up display, but generally, I look at the map, or my compass, it's faster and provides pretty accurate information. 
Again, the game design here with large realistic environments encourages players to use their maps. It continues to help create a more authentic and grounded war experience. The maps are truly one of the best parts of this game. And in my opinion, if someone's complaining about the openness, the lack of cover, I think they might be missing the point. Next, I wanna talk about team composition. Can you imagine if Hell Let Loose allowed every player to pick their role and their equipment with no restrictions? I guarantee that there would be 90% snipers, 5% tanks, and 5% anti-tank. Now, perhaps that could be a fun lobby, but definitely would not make for a fun base game experience. Thankfully, Hell Let Loose again makes a restrictive design choice for the sake of balance and fun gameplay by limiting certain roles. For example, only certain roles have access to automatic weapons. There are only two snipers on both sides, there are only a few tank squads on each team, and only one machine gunner and one anti-tank class per squad. And I think this is an interesting point because as we move into quote, next gen gaming, we often see how games talk about giving player freedom as an essential part of the experience. However, this game is different. It says to heck with player freedom. Do you think a soldier should always choose his weapon, his class? No, he followed orders and he was given a rifle and told to go kill the enemy. Hell Let Loose is the officer that doesn't care about your preferences. It says, this is our game. This is our experience, which we created. These are your options. Feel free to enjoy it. No messing around with player choice, player freedom, player expression. This game intentionally suppresses the player knowing that chaos would follow without these barriers. This choice to limit player freedom is actually a great trade-off to help facilitate balance and create a fulfilling, authentic war experience. Most shooters today run into an issue with voice communication. Players have the ability to all talk and most end up not. It's chaos and I know many people end up either joining a Discord server with their small group of friends while playing or not talking at all. Perhaps it's fear from cyberbullying, perhaps it's social anxiety, but this game overcomes all of that by baking communication into the core gameplay experience. I'd say many players do actually use the mic eventually, as players warm up to the game and see how integral communication is. The exceptional voice communication design facilitates community and camaraderie. And in addition to that, I'd say a perhaps underappreciated aspect of this game is that I generally don't run into children talking smack about my mother. In fact, most people have a much deeper voice than I do and tend to talk about strategic things such as where they saw a tank and where they plan to put down an outpost or the fact that they need supplies brought to F7 on the map. Most of the time, I find myself in a squad with nice, like-minded, probably 20 to 30 year old dudes who are just like me, trying to relax and have a good time immersing themselves in this war experience and communicating in the way this game is designed to be played. These folks and this community are often genuinely helpful when learning the game. Not to say I haven't heard a little bit of smack talk, but it is usually related to the game, like facing your tank the wrong way in a tank battle. Another thing that I love about the voice communication in this game is that we don't have 50 people yelling on the mic all at once, as we only hear our own squad, while nearby soldiers can talk to you if they intentionally press a button to speak. And even then, they actually have to be within a certain proximity to be able to reach you verbally. It's almost like you'd expect in real life. Theoretically, you'd be near your own squad, so speaking to them would be quick and easy. While someone outside your squad, who you may share a uniform with but are otherwise unfamiliar, have to get your attention to tell you something important. It adds another level of depth to the game and creates what's truly a dynamic experience. Now, this game is a bit overwhelming for new players. I remember thinking, I haven't even killed anyone yet, but damn, this atmosphere, this sound, this scale, it's inspiring. Then blam, I get that black screen with a small word saying, killed in action. I'm thinking, who the hell killed me? I get back to the spawn screen. There's this confusing map. What the hell are these symbols? Where's the objective? Who's my squad? Wait, are you serious? I have to wait 30 seconds to respawn? These thoughts and others began to swirl in my head. And as I respawned, I made that long hike again to only get popped again in a few minutes. That was my experience when joining Hell Let Loose for the first time. Now, some people like myself don't know when to give up. I could not accept the fact that I just sucked. I had to be missing something and it was obvious that I didn't understand this game. I remember thinking, what is this Gary thing people are talking about? Who the hell is Gary? But seriously, it takes time to learn the rules of the game and to understand the flow of it. Understanding that yes, standing near and in the objective circle matters, but there's so much more to it than that. There are tons of little details to know, especially when we start talking about supplies and nodes, spawn placements, etc. And a new player can sense the depth of some strategy at play. They can feel the immersion, and if they're anything like me, they will be back for more. If they don't like slower or hard games, they probably won't. It's that simple. This game doesn't really cater to large mainstream gaming with the choices it has made. In my opinion, that's fine. We don't need another generic shooter. There's this other game I've been playing a lot of recently called Helldivers 2, 
which is very fun. You should check it out. Totally different from this game. But the CEO or the game director said something along the lines of a game made for everyone is a game made for no one. And I think that this game really embodies that idea. This game is hard. It's not easy to learn or to pick up. It's a game that doesn't hold your hand. And for some, especially those with tight schedules, limited patience, or perhaps preconceived ideas of what a shooter is like from the likes of Battlefield or Call of Duty, this game might just be a day of frustration. It's not a game where you always get a lot of kills and sometimes you spend more time running and crawling than actually shooting. There's no special kill streaks or abilities to get you back on track either. However, for everyone starting out, you'll die a lot. It's part of the learning process. In a way, it's like the Dark Souls or Elden Ring of shooters. Some people will be drawn to it because they like the grim World War II aesthetic, but many will bounce off as the challenge is too great. But in a similar fashion to Souls games, the players who stick around will likely enjoy the depth, the strategy, the glory of combat that this game offers which other modern shooters simply do not. There's something special about challenging games that don't hold your hand as you slowly unravel the mystery and master the mechanics. Modern games often prioritize instant gratification, handing out meaningless cosmetics through a battle pass to convince you that you invested your valuable time well. While this game might not give you much in the way of new clothing, it will instead give you battle stories. And as you fight alongside your recently acquainted brothers in arms, you'll cherish those memories. You'll remember and appreciate the times you narrowly survived a bombing run, or stormed the beach in France and survived to capture the bluffs, essentially recreating the D-Day experience as close as any video game possibly could. The game has already been out for many years already, about five years at this point. Given that the original developers sold the project to Team 17, their publisher in 2023, Team 17 and their studio Cover 6 will want to continue to maintain and create a compelling game that will attract new and returning players to generate money to get the most return on investment. Considering that this change of hands only occurred recently, I'd assume we would see at least another several years of development. As the transition was a bit shaky at first, it seems things are moving in the right direction again. There are new maps being released and the community seems steady. The newest map to join the roster is Mortain, which is inspired by a German counteroffensive to the American Operation Cobra set in Normandy. Again, I love that they are basing the new material on realism, real battles, and real places. And I hope that they continue that trend with future content. It's interesting to think about where this game will go in the future. It seems logical at some point that we could see a Pacific War map or two getting released, possibly maps of Iwo Jima or Guadalcanal, and I know that the player base would absolutely love that. That would be a more ambitious project as they would have to create a tropical environment, which would be quite a bit different from anything else we've seen in this game so far, which features mostly temperate European climates. But if their goal is to sustain this game and even perhaps grow it, this would definitely turn some heads and make this game a destination for FPS fans looking for something a bit different. There have been so many World War II shooters since gaming emerged, but none that create moments that feel this satisfying or immersive. I think this game isn't for everyone, but it might just be for you. It's challenging and sometimes infuriating, but I'm glad I stuck with it. I truly look forward to the battles ahead and the stories of valor that I will no doubt create when playing.